Okay, cool. So uh, let me jump right into it. I'm a senior developer advocate at Weaviate, and Weaviate is an open source uh, vector database. Uh, what I wanted to do today was keep it fun and show some of the cool things that people are doing uh, with Weaviate and in general, what you can do with vector databases in the computer vision space. So, okay. So I'm going to start off just a, a quick, I'm not going to go uh, um, into as many details as, uh, as Philip. Um, thank you for doing that. I'm going to give just a two, three minute intro to what vector databases are and what they allow you to accomplish. And at the heart of all these applications that I, that I list out here, um, to uh, image-based recommender systems for e-commerce, video searching uh, that uh, a couple of startups are, are working on, um, uh, building on top of vector databases and multimodal uh, generative feedback loops. At the heart of all of these are is vector search. So I thought it would be relevant to talk about vector search in the first five minutes, and then we can just um, show a bunch of demos that are, uh, that are pretty cool, I think. Okay. So what are vector databases? Vector databases really just take unstructured data. Um, it can be images, uh, videos, as was mentioned, uh, written language, audio. And if you have a machine learning model that understands uh, this unstructured data, that knows how to embed this uh, unstructured data, then it essentially uh, uses that functionality to convert your data into vectors. Every data point turns into a vector and I like to think of this as um, almost like a Dewey Decimal System for the library. Let's say every data point is a book and every book has some uh, sort of a topic. And based on that topic, the Dewey Decimal System is going to tell you what number is going to be allocated to that, uh, to that book. Right? And that number dictates where in the library that book goes. So if you think of every unstructured object as a, as a book, you have a machine learning model that orchestrates where that data point is embedded into uh, in uh, in vector space. And then so here, um, the one thing that this machine learning model preserves um, is that if you have similar data points, they're going to be closer together uh, in vector space. There's different distance metrics that you can uh, use to quantify uh, similar, uh, similar vectors. But the main idea is that um, Similar vectors are situated closer together. Vectors that are different from each other, objects that are different from each other are further apart. And this goes along quite well with the library analogy because you're not gonna find a uh, a textbook on astronomy that's uh, sitting right next to Shakespeare in the library, right? You're gonna find them in different locations of the library based on how similar they are to the, to the books that are around them and based on what section they're in. So we take, Every data point, we convert it into numbers using a uh, using a machine learning model, and then we pop all of these vectors into a vector database. So every every vector goes uh, into our uh, embedding space or our vector space, and then you can essentially think of every data point as a book in a library somewhere. And when you perform vector search, effectively what you're doing is you're going to the librarian and you're saying. Hey, you write down, this is the type of the book that I want, or this is the topic that I'm interested in. You give them that piece of paper with your query on it. They go back to the library and they say, okay, this is a book that has to do with religion. The religion section is somewhere over here. What is What specifically are you interested in about religion? Okay, you're interested in this book. Let me take these five books that are the most relevant and bring them back. And you can go through them to see which one you wanted to analyze. So this idea of embedding unstructured data based on uh, different uh, locations in embedding space and then retrieving them based on proximity uh, is effectively the bread and butter of a vector database. Right? We do this uh, vector search at scale over billions of objects um, within milliseconds. Right? Uh, and so every application, whether it's computer vision or natural language of a vector database, at the heart of it lives this concept of uh, nearest neighbor search, proximity search, where given a vector, I'm going to find out what are the other vectors that are uh, in close proximity to that vector. Um, and that's the main idea behind vector databases. There's a lot of, uh, of course, uh, a lot of engineering details, but at the heart of it, um, this is what we're trying to do. And so let's say you've got your uh, embedding space now and you come up with a question. Uh, you take that question, you pass it through the exact same machine learning model that you use to embed your data. So let's say you, you take a question 
and you embed it through your ML model, and that question now lives in your uh, vector space, that question is also represented as some uh, natural language query. Right? So if, if you query your vector database with the word kitten, that word is going to be projected into embedding space. And then you can say, okay, what, what are the closest vectors to the query vector? And then return the top five, the top 10. Um, on this image, I've also got, on this uh, image of uh, my embedding space, I've got words and uh, images as well. Um, and Philip went into this a little bit where, depending on if your model understands both words and images, you can actually project both of these modalities uh, into the same embedding space. And this allows for cross-modal search and retrieval. So you can search for words using images, images using images, um, uh, images using words, so on and so forth. And depending on however many modalities you have, you can perform as many um, cross-modal searches as you want, right? Um, there's a lot of interesting work that's going on in this field of uh, uh, multimodal uh, data sets where you can embed audio uh, images, natural language, uh, depth uh, images, all into the same vector space because at the end of the day, they're just vectors. And then you can perform all sorts of interesting cross-modal searches where you could pass in the image of a lion and then retrieve what a lion sounds like from your vector database. Okay. okay. So once you have these vector representations, um, this is the vector part of a vector database, right? Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the database part, uh, which is you basically have to be able to do this uh, at scale, right? You have millions and billions of objects that you have to store the vectors for, as well as the unstructured representations, the images or the, the natural language for. And then you have thousands and thousands of queries that you have to run against both the uh, the unstructured data as well as the vector representations. Okay. Uh, and so the, the database component of this uh, is what makes sure that this works as you scale up the number of objects, the dimensions of these objects, as well as the uh, the number of times you query this per second. So how do you scale this up? Well, you basically have to make sure that you have uh, enough compute to be able to do uh, filtered search over your unstructured data, as well as vector or similarity search over the vectors that you've embedded into your vector space. Um, you have to make sure that you, the machine learning models that you're using, um, the inference and you, you can inference and you can scale their usage in production. A lot of the ML models that we're using are from academia or they're released from, from industrial labs. Uh, we want to make sure that if you're inferencing thousands and thousands of times uh, using them, that they scale up and they're not the bottleneck. And another component of this is real-time uh, full CRUD support. Uh, because each one of these objects that you see on the screen here is potentially a image or an object, and you have data that's coming in, you have to be able to insert new objects and then create the vector representations for those objects. And those representations have to coexist with the previously defined and vectorized data. Uh, you have to be able to delete or update vector representations as well. And so all of that functionality um, is uh, goes in to help with the scalability and uh, implementation of the, of the database portion. So in short, that's pretty much what a vector database is, right? Um, it, and uh, VV8 is a vector database and it understands your data from the perspective of uh, understanding vectors. And because the ML model understands your data, we take advantage of those ML models. So uh, in a way, the, the database understands your data. So typically what a vector search pipeline with, uh, with a vector database would look like is everything kind of revolves around the machine learning model. The machine learning model takes human understandable data and it translates it into machine understandable data, these vectors. So your data comes in, we turn that into vectors and you populate that into the vector database. And then a user comes by and they have a query and this query is of the same form as the data that the model understands. Right? So if the model understands um, uh, English, then you can query it in English. If it's a multilingual model, if it understands Chinese, um, Hindi, then you can query it in whatever language uh, that it understands. And you go in and you take that query vector, you populate that uh, into the vector database and you perform your uh, nearest neighbor search. And then you can take the list of results, rank them, re-rank them. You can do all sorts of interesting things with them, but essentially what you're doing is taking those results and you're presenting them in some form uh, to the user. Uh, what's really interesting about uh, Weaviate is that it's very modular in the sense that 
Um, if you don't have a machine learning model or if you don't have vectorized data, you can use any one of the ML models that we've integrated with from OpenAI to Cohere to any of the models that are hosted on Hugging Face. Uh, you can even bring your own models and create a module to vectorize uh, your data with your proprietary models. Um, of course, the, any data that the model understands, uh, you'll be able to use with it. The what you do with the output is actually uh, also modular. So if you want to take the output and send it off to some sort of uh, summarization uh, uh, summarization module, then uh, you could do that and then send it to the user. Uh, so all of these modules uh, are pre-built in, and you can define your own modules, or you can use the ones that we've uh, that we've already uh, integrated with um, to get that functionality out of the box. Okay, awesome. So that's vector databases uh, out of the way. What I want to talk about now is just some really cool applications of, uh, of um, vector databases as far as computer vision is concerned. So the first application that I'm going to talk about is uh, recommender systems. Um, and these uh, recommender systems are image-based in the sense that you're looking at uh, images of products and you're recommending um, products that are similar based on how they look as opposed to how they're described or the uh, the brand uh, that they're from. Okay. And so in this case, I'm going to go into a little bit about recommender systems and how they differ from the, the bread and butter of uh, searching that vector databases are generally uh, used for. Okay. So search is an objective task. Okay. It's query driven. If you have a if you have a vector database and you give it a query, you're going to get back the the most relevant results based on proximity. You define a distance metric and then um, you find the most relevant results and, and you get that back. It doesn't depend on who's asking. It doesn't depend on, um, it, it doesn't depend on uh, essentially when the question is asked. Right? So it, it's completely objective. And I'll give an example of this. Whereas a recommendation is not objective, right? It's subjective. Depending on who's asking, when they're asking, why they're asking, what depending on their history, your recommendation results can change. And so not only do you have to take into account user preferences, but you also have to take into account product features, the brand of a product with how the product looks, what um, what products the user has bought uh, historically to recommend the right thing to them. Right? And so the main idea here is, let's say you query your vector database with uh, the query basketball jersey, you can do cross-modal search using CLIP, a uh, multimodal uh, ML model, to return something like this, right? And in fact, returning any one of these would be the right answer because they're all basketball jerseys. Right? And so uh, search is objective. All these are technically the right answer. If you query a recommender system with a basketball jersey, what should what a good recommender system should do is say who's asking, right? So if this guy is asking, then out of these three basketball jerseys, that is the right answer, right? The other two are not the right answer, even though they're basketball jerseys. On the other hand, if that guy is asking, if, if, a, if a Boston Celtics fan is asking, then that is the right answer, right? The other two are not right answers. This is irrelevant. And then this, he actually probably hates this one, right? Um, so in, in this sense, uh, recommendation is subjective. So how do, you, how do you square this concept of vector databases only performing vector search with recommender systems requiring this, uh, this knowledge about who's asking? Um, the way you do that in Weaviate um, is by encoding user-specific knowledge uh, in the form of uh, graph connections. So the idea here is that you have a user vector, you have a, a user class that goes in, and if you interact with a product, that interaction will be preserved in the vector database as a cross-reference. So there will be a cross-reference from the user class to the product class, and uh, more in more detail for a particular user to a particular product, right? And you can have multiple cross-references. So you can have products that are cross-referenced across different brands. So all the Nike shoes are going to be cross-referenced to that particular uh, particular brand. Right? Um, and what this allows you to do is not just encode similarity uh, using a vector, but also encode similarity using symbolic uh, graph connections. And if we want to go uh, further, what we'd like to do is we'd like the vector for these objects to be a function of what other classes uh, these objects are connected to. Right? So if a user likes the Lakers, we want their vector to change as a result of their preference. Right? Um, 
And so this is a, this is pretty interesting work that we've uh, implemented in Weaviate where you can use these cross references to influence what the vector for an object looks like. Right? So how this works, let me give you an example. Let's say you have a user who's on your e-commerce platform and they've bought a shirt and a, uh, and a, a, a couple of boots, right? Their vector is actually going to be a, uh, a, a an aggregation. Here we use a centroid, um, but so their vector is going to be the mean of all the other, uh, of the vectors of the products that they've interacted with. Right? Um, they're not gonna have a, a unique vector. Their vector, their identity is essentially the products that they've interacted with. Right? And so um, this is pretty interesting because now uh, your uh, your user, when they create an account or when they log into the platform, they they don't have a vector. They're, they're inserted into the vector database without a vector. And then as they start interacting with objects, their vector gets updated in real time. And so the cool thing about this is that you can have millions of objects on your e-commerce platform. And as the person is interacting in real time, you can start making real time recommendations. Uh, and so this is scalable um, search uh, as recommendations. Right? And where com the computer vision part of this comes in is uh, in, in the demo that I'll show uh, shortly, you can actually go in and vectorize each one of these products as uh, vectorize the images of each one of these products and then perform uh, vector search in order to do recommendations across these. Right? So in this framework, the identity of the user is essentially the products of products that they've interacted with or they've bought in past sessions. Um, a great use case for this would be instance-based uh, recommender systems where let's say I log into a platform. You don't have a lot of history around how I've interacted with the platform before. Um, this is one way to resolve the cold start problem where you start showing them um, products where they search for a product and they start clicking around, you can start immediately uh, uh, displaying relevant searches to them. And so effectively how the math works here is your the vector of the user is a, is a centroid for all the other vectors that they've interacted with. And every time they interact with a new item and they end up buying or liking that item, you can in real time update the, the vector for the user there. Um, I'm also going to show you a demo here where uh, this code is open source, by the way, I'll send out a link later on, but we take each one of these images. And so you can, you can perform searches here where you can say, uh, let's say I'm interested in watches. So this uses clip, so you can perform uh, word to image searches, and then you can start clicking around this kind of e-commerce platform. So if I like um, digital watches, you can start clicking this, and then we'll start showing you uh, more watches like this. Start clicking around. Um, then if you like backpacks as well, you can click these things. And then depending on how close uh, the uh, the vectors for these products are now to your user uh, vector, it'll reorganize and redistribute uh, uh, all of the inputs. This is useful for instance-based short-term recommendations. It's not really useful for long-term recommendations because imagine if you have uh, a very diverse set of choices where I, I start to pick like random things like a jump rope and uh, a backpack and um, a hoodie. Now the centroid of my identity, my user identity, my user vector is going to, it, it can potentially be in uh, in uh, no man's land in embedding space, right? So uh, you wanna use this for short-term recommendations, not longer-term recommendations. All right. Um, the other thing that I wanna talk about is video search. So there is a, uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at some companies that are using uh, Weaviate under the hood and the interesting things that they're doing. Um, so Ordis is one, one such company. And the main idea behind this uh, company is it's a transcription based uh, generative video search. Uh, and what that means is you can take uh, YouTube videos, you transcribe them using an audio to text model. Um, Whisper is a great one that you can use from, from uh, OpenAI. You take uh, all of your text, you can then chunk that text, vectorize it, store it into uh, your vector database. And then next time somebody comes in and asks a question about something uh, in, that, uh, in that video, you can retrieve relevant context from the vector database. And then you can provide that context to a large language model. And the large language model does retrieval augmented generation, right? So you ground the generation of the large language model 
in the context of uh, retrieved snippets from your chunked and vectorized uh, transcripts from the videos. Um, so this is pretty cool, actually. You can go, uh, you can get this, uh, it's a Chrome plugin, and you can go to any YouTube video uh, that they support. So they, they don't support uh, all the channels. They support these few channels for now. Uh, it's It's relatively new. And then you can start asking questions of that video. Um, so this is a podcast that I recently watched here. Right? And you can go in and start asking uh, questions uh, of uh, of this podcast. So this is a podcast about uh, Modular, which is a company that's writing um, Mojo, which is a superset of Python. It's a new programming language. And I love Python. So I, I watch this podcast and you can start asking questions like, um, does Mojo uh, support uh, memory allocation. And then it looks through uh, the chunked transcript to return a response, gives it to a large language model, it styles it, and it uh, responds accordingly. Um, so though this is not a computer vision application, this is purely natural language. It's applied to the computer vision space. So I thought it'd be interesting to show you guys this. Um, another application, which is also video search, and that is an application of computer vision, is this next one. Right? So. Uh, this company, which is uh, called Bwant, it's from they're from uh, France. They do a frame by frame uh, video search, right? And so the idea here is instead of transcribing the audio from a YouTube video, you can take a YouTube video and you can take a, a frame by frame uh, encoding of the video, take the take the vectors, store them into a vector database, and then you can perform real time search. Uh, so let's say you have a, a YouTube video and you want to know if that YouTube video or you want to search over the video and find out exactly which snippet uh, contains information about uh, dogs or cats or something like this. You can get frame perfect um, uh, video searches over here. Right? So it effectively retrieves uh, timestamps and then you can play that video. Um, this is also pretty cool. So let me show you a demo uh, of this in action. So here I'm going to, so I'm from Toronto, by the way. Um, and if you're in Toronto and you're looking for places to visit, you can take uh, you can take uh, any YouTube video. And I've already pre-processed this uh, video. So the, the WeVA instance that's running in the background here has already parsed all of these frames and it, it, it's encoded them and has the vectors for them. So this is going to take, uh, this is not going to take too long. But um, if you have a new video, if it's like a 10, 15 minute video, it'll take um, a couple of minutes to just uh, inference, uh, get the vectors, and then um, uh, you can search through them. So now that, let's say you want to search over this video. Now that this video is encoded, stored in a vector database, uh, you can start searching over it. And so let's say you're interested in uh, uh, museums. You can go in and search this. It'll come back with relevant timestamps, uh, time stamps, with the first one being the most relevant. Okay. So if you click that guy and then you start playing the video. I'm going to stop it there. But th this is a 14 second snippet that matched um, that that uh, most closely matched with your word search over here. And if you look at the bottom here, this is a um, this is not exactly the distance between your word and the frames. It's actually a uh, you can almost think of it as a rolling average of the of the similarity. And the main idea behind this application was that you want to uh, you don't want to just maximize matching of a query with one frame. What you want to do is match uh, a um, a query with multiple frames, and this gets into the concept that Philip was talking about where you have a temporal uh, concept here. So that temporal aspect is handled here by taking the similarity between your uh, between your query and a frame and then just rolling that out over time so that you don't get sudden kind of jumps and uh, and dips in similarity. And then you effectively look for the most similar um, bunch of frames uh, that match with your with your query. Um, it's pretty uh, cool because this is a fine-tuned version of Clip, um, but it also has a, a lot of additional functionality here. So it has uh, optical character recognition. It has uh, fine-tuning on specific uh, types of buildings and structures as well. So for example, here, if I search for the CN Tower, which is a, 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 um, a building in, in Canada, 
it'll go out and it'll pick places where the CN Tower was found, right? So if I play this video here, let me turn the audio off. You can see it brings up the CN Tower. But if you notice this blip, why is there a blip there? Like I can go here and I can play this. So here they're talking about Ripley's Aquarium. And then there, for some reason, there's a blip here. And the reason why is because they, the Ripley's Aquarium is close to the CN Tower and they cut out and show the CN Tower for a couple of seconds there. That's why you have that small kind of blip for a couple of frames and then it dies down. So it's not a sustained, um, it's it's not good, good enough of a search to be uh, top ranked. Right? Um, the interesting thing here is that it, it also has OCR. So if, uh, if you're looking for very specific words in the video, um, it'll actually find those as well. Right? So you can play around with this. I think it's publicly available, just uh, bwant.it. Uh, so this is uh, one pretty cool application. Um, the other thing, let me see how much time I have. Okay, I've got four minutes. Um, do I want to, one second, let me see. I had a little bit on multimodal generative feedback loops, but maybe what I'll do is I'll cut it off there and um, we'll take questions. Right? So let me go to my last slide. I'll share these slides later. So if you want, you can go over the generative feedback loops concept. In general, the idea behind generative feedback loops is if you take a, um, a vector database and you query it and you provide the relevant context to a large language model the same way that Ordis is doing, um, rather than just show the response of the large language model back to the user, you can actually store it back uh, as, a, as a unique object into the vector database. And then you can start to um, query over that the next time. And this way you can actually persist information uh, between conversations, you can get the large language model to summarize a concept and store it back in. And the reason why I put it in here is because if you have a large language model that is multimodal and you have a vector database that uh, embeds data using a multimodal model, you can actually get it to uh, uh, embed in images and then answer questions using those images or generate images uh, and then embed those images into your vector database. Uh, we currently don't have multimodal generative feedback loop functionality, but we are working, uh, we do have just natural language generative feedback loops. And I think they're pretty interesting. If you're if you're interested in this, there's a link over here. Um, you can explore this and this is also open source. So uh, you can find this on GitHub as well. And I'll also send a link to Jimmy that, they, that he can share with you uh, afterwards as well. Uh, but with that, let me leave this on the screen and then um, I can take questions if there are any. Yeah, it looks like you've got five questions in the Q&A widget. Awesome. Uh, one second. So when you query, they have to be converted to vector space before they are sent to the database for lookup. Yes. So how it happens uh, in, in um, Weavia is that we have an inference container where we host the model. And uh, when the query comes in, it goes to the exact same machine learning model and we take the vector and then we, uh, we can see, okay, what are the closest vectors to this vector, um, to this query vector uh, in my vector database. And then you can retrieve the, the top 10 results, top 100 results. The user usually specifies that. Um, and then you can send it back to the user. Or uh, again, you can process them, send it to a large language model to provide context. Um, okay, so there's another question. Very interesting. In multimodal applications, can you discuss a bit more about how audio and image can be embedded in the same vector space? Yeah, so this is a really cool topic. There's a couple of ways that this can be done, right? The first way that this can be done is you take independent models that understand that modality. So you have a vision transformer that understands um, uh, uh, images. You have a um, audio transformer that understands audio. And usually they use like 1D convolutions to extract features from the audio. And then that transformer will understand audio. So all of these independent models can embed and understand the independent modalities, but how they kind of bind them together, there's there's one paper that was released from Meta AI, how they bind them together is using the same contrastive loss as clip. So what they do is they say, if I've got a image of a lion and I've got the sound of a lion, regardless of which modality or, or uh, uh, model that they're coming from, I want the embeddings, the vectors to be closer together for the samples that are that are similar. And I want the embeddings for samples that are different. So if I have 
the sound of a river and the sound of a lion or the image of a lion, I want those embeddings to be further apart in, in vector space. So they use this contrastive loss uh, function to, to kind of combine or separate uh, separate uh, embeddings uh, across modalities. That's one approach, and that's the practical approach. Uh, a more academic approach is to train one huge model that is cross-modal. That model understands all of the different modalities, and it actually gains information based on the modality that you add. So the idea behind that is maybe you pass in audio data, and the audio data from a video adds a lot of information, and then the image data from the video doesn't add as much information. Like you can be watching a movie and then looking away and you could still understand what's going on in the movie because you have audio input. And then you look back and you kind of fill in the blanks with what would have happened visually, right? So as you add modalities, the model fits the different uh, fits the different modalities better and better. And it kind of fills in the blanks uh, between modalities. So those are the two main approaches. Um, I don't know if I have more time to take questions. I, I, can, I can take all of them if you want, Jimmy. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a few more. Okay, cool. Um, another question is, is it possible to embed movements in a database like WeV8? Search through security video to find someone hitting someone. Um, so currently it isn't, but with the next release, we are uh, supporting, um, we're going to uh, use, uh, we're going to release another multimodal model. Uh, and that one actually allows you to embed movement. Right? So, um, if you're asking movement in a video, that'll also be possible. But usually when I think about movement, it has to do with accelerometers, right? So you've got um, uh, XYZ acceleration, you've got XYZ uh, rotational acceleration, so a gyroscopic um, uh, movement. Those will also be uh, embeddable uh, into EVA using the same multimodal model that I'm talking about from, from Meta AI. There's another question. What do you mean by short-term recommendation and long-term recommendation? What I mean by short-term recommendation is let's say you log into an app and you start, let's say you're looking for sneakers, right? And you start clicking around and you're, you add two, three sneakers to your, um, your uh, cart. That is what I would say is short-term recommendation. In that instance, you're only interested in buying that type of product. And so the recommendations I make would be uh, within that category. Now, if you do long-term recommendations. Let's say you link to my Amazon account and you look over everything that I've bought since I created that account. There's going to be a hodgepodge of stuff from cameras to sneakers to shirts. And in that case, uh, the example that I went over would not be that relevant because we're using a centroid to approximate what you're interested in. And if you take the centroid of really different things, like if I bought chips and then shirts, what is the average between a chip between chips and a shirt? It doesn't really make make a lot of sense, right? So that's what I meant by short term and long term um, uh, recommendations. What is the typical response time? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. What I would recommend for that, if if you're comparing different vector databases, um, there's actually a a third party, um, so A N benchmarks. Um, I would recommend looking at this. So this is an independent company that went and compared. Oops, I realize you can't see my. Can you guys see my? Can you can you guys still see my screen here? Yeah, we see the GitHub page. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I would recommend looking at this. This is a, a third party company that went and kind of uh, looked at all these uh, vector databases, in, including uh, Weaviate, um, and they they can show the results over here, right? So. This is one that I would uh, would look over to compare uh, query performance uh, and all that good stuff. See other questions. What are some challenges you face while trying to combine embeddings from different modalities? That's the cool thing. So we don't actually uh, combine different modalities. The machine learning model combines modalities, right? So the vector database actually doesn't uh, combine modalities. The vector database just has to handle um, handle input of those different modalities and then processing them so that they're in a format that the model understands. So um, the most that we do on the model side is data pre-processing. So let's say you're taking accelerometer data from your phone. You have to make sure that the, it's in exactly the same format every time so that the ML model can inference and you can do a forward propagation through your ML model using that data. Right? You have to make sure that the images are in a given kind of um, shape. You can resize them. Um, a lot of the models do that themselves. For some of the models that we're working with now, um, they're not pre-processing the data really well. 
So we do a lot of the error handling around that. But the embedding is all the work of the, the research uh, labs that are developing the models themselves.